to your memories. <laughs> if not, my reading of it should quicken you. We, having his nature, will most surely be confronted with completely different circumstances and need to demonstrate other actions that fulfill his nature. In other words, everything can't be spelled out for you. You need to know the Lord. And you need to know the Lord that's in you. And you need to be able to function by Christ, not some man's teaching, mine or anybody else's. All right, in actuality, it's not about doing the exact kindnesses Jesus did, but behaving, uh, <clears throat> but behaving in the same way, which is that of not putting self first, but God and others. And you can see that in uh, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. Beginning with verse 35. And that's not what I was looking at, or is it? Oh, no, yeah, it is. Okay, sorry. I got, I got tired and stopped turning pages. <laughs> and then one of them, who was a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law. <clears throat> Jesus said unto him, now you got to realize he's talking to God here. He's talking to the one who sort of made up the list. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. So he's asking him, which is the greatest? And Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Okay. So with your motive and with thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like to it, likened unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Okay, come on. You remember how you could break one law and then, I mean, a commandment, and by that break the whole law? Well, this is basically telling us that in those first two commandments, Really, everything hangs on that. All right. So what we're saying is, um, in actuality, it is not about doing the exact kindness as Jesus did, but behaving in the same way, which is that of not putting self first, but God and others. God and others. All right. This fulfills the first commandment, but it happens to be, but it happens by life and not by law. Do you see that? The requirement is the same, but it's not required of you. It's required of Christ in you. If you put it on you, if you make yourself the one that's going to do it, if you put yourself under the law, you're going to fail at some juncture. But Christ, anybody ever heard the phrase or the song Jesus never fails okay now the question is is that a good song or do we actually believe that you know because we you know God we get so religious we sing the best stuff but I mean it's not about how good you can sing the best stuff it is are we going to live it is Christ going to be the one who is the fulfillment of all, all things or are we going to keep See, Jesus fulfills, we end up keeping. But we don't want to be about the old covenant relationship of keeping the law. We want Christ fulfilling the law. See, again, let me just try to spell that out for you. Jesus didn't keep the law, he fulfilled the law. <clears throat> because why? Because the law was the best attempt to write, when, that, when Israel said, look, just tell us what we'll do and we'll do it. That's when he went up there and got the Ten Commandments and said, okay, hey, if you just want something to do, here you go, try that. <laughs> well, that's what happened. It's exactly what happened. And they went, oh, good. You know, all that God tells us to do, we'll do it. No, you won't. 
you know? And we need to be able to look at ourselves and go, no, you won't, you slimy dude. You know what I mean? You think that you're so good and you're not. You're a mess, but Jesus is. Is it so hard for you, dude, to, to get out of the way and let it be Christ? Is it really so difficult? And, of course, the flesh goes, yeah, it pretty much is. <laughs> you know? It's like, I, I'm better at keeping the law than getting out of the way. That's how flesh is. It'll go, I will do, no, he doesn't do better. He can't fulfill the law because that's the only way that you can keep the law in a manner that satisfies God. That's Christ who fulfills it. But we actually would rather give it our gung-ho best of doing the Christian thing for God than getting out of the way by the cross and letting Christ be the, the fulfillment of that. We would rather keep our life and work than lose our life and let Christ be glorified in us. Here, did y'all see my new uh, chalk holders? Everybody on Skype, aren't they cute? I saw them at the store and I went, I gotta have those. <laughs> bring him home and Deb goes, how old are you? <laughs> well, well, actually there's three of them, so it's Bert and Ernie and Phoebe. <clears throat> what a, a lesser known, yeah. In fact, I would only see Phoebe while it was going on. Oh, look. If that, if that doesn't scare you and make you want to get out of here, I don't know what will. <clears throat> All right. So uh, since Israel did not understand what God required, meaning through the, through the Old Covenant, he didn't understand, they didn't understand what God required but thought it was about commandments, they did not know how to apply its meaning into the small things of daily existence. They applied it wrong. They made it about their own righteousness. And Paul, when he truly began to comprehend Christ, he said, I want to know him, but not, in, not having mine own righteousness in the process of it. So he listed off some things that couldn't come by his own righteousness. To know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, the power of his resurrection being made conformable to his death. It always comes back to that. It's sad, isn't it? <laughs> For some people, it's sad. It always comes back to the cross, but it does, it has to. Nothing gets past the cross, folks, except Jesus. He's the only one rose up from it. You know what I'm saying? Nothing gets past the cross. So Christ in you is the hope of glory. Is that so hard? <laughs> is that so, you know, I mean, I've had people go, what? You know, you always teach that stuff about the cross. I'm just teaching that Christ is now the one. He's glorified. He's, you know, I'm not preaching us. I'm preaching not us. And they go, yeah, well, you just think you're, I, have you listened to me? I've had to say that to people. Have you ever listened to me preach? <laughs> but that's, <clears throat> and the question is, though they've sat in here many times, they never listen to me. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> Remember that man. <laughs> All right. Um, so Jesus demonstrated the nature of his being or the nature of the kingdom. Because what is it? Okay, listen carefully to this statement. And this isn't in my notes. What is it that rules God? Well, it's his being, his nature. Now, that is God. That's his essence. Amen. But if you, if, you, if you can see it the way I said it, what is it that rules him, then you realize that it comes down to his <laughs> being, and, that, and therefore, the kingdom of God is his being. The government, let me say it like that. What governs God? The government of God is what is in accord with his being. 
Okay. And therefore, it is what comes by his being. That's the new covenant. Not after carnal commandments, but after the law of an endless life. Praise God. That's good news to me. <clears throat> okay, what was his kingdom like compared to what governed them? Meaning all those that were around him. Well, he was crucified, and they were the crucifiers. And that's, we can see over in, uh, let's see, I, I put Matthew 5. Thirty-eight. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we'll just start at 38 and read down. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. This is Jesus speaking. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Okay. So... It's funny how he words this because this is, the, this is the commandments that God gave to him. But he's saying, well, you've heard how it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. What? Yeah, come on. I mean, great teaching, but try applying that in real life. See? And that's, that's where the kicker comes is, that's possible. Do you believe that? Yes. Yes. But it's only possible by Christ. No. It's not possible by me or any of you. There's no hope for you. Are you glad to hear that? <laughs> There's no hope for you or me. There's only Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so, so he says, you know, I mean, an eye for an eye. Come on, an eye for an eye. If that's true, and you really set that in motion, pretty soon you've just got a nation of blind people. Is that right? Yeah. And, and toothless. <laughs> you know. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, and whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also, the other also. Okay, so what do we see in here? We're seeing smiters and smitten. Okay, let me say it like I said it a while ago. We're seeing someone crucified and we're seeing someone who's a crucifier. Oh, well, <coughs> you know, uh, when it comes to... <coughs> you know, dealing with my brother or something, then I won't, I'll be the crucified or something like that. But if somebody's wrong, we have to expose that and we have to, you know, I'm not going to delve in that too far, but I'm telling you that, that, that Jesus wasn't wrong, but they thought he was wrong. They assumed it <clears throat> and, they, and judged accordingly and killed the Son of God. Okay. So is, could it be possible that the son could be in someone and lives in such a way that he doesn't defend himself or she and people will assume they're wrong? What is that old saying that, uh, you know, if you don't speak up, you're, I forget how it goes, you're already judged as wrong. You're already guilty then because you didn't speak up and defend yourself. And that, that defending yourself in the world is the height of declaring that I'm not wrong here. Okay? <clears throat> okay, here's the hard part, and it's hard for us. It's hard. I understand that. I don't like to be the bearer of things that are hard. I just want to share Christ. But, you know, is it possible by taking not the higher ground, but the lower ground, you could actually be releasing more Christ than if you were out on a big ministry doing a big, bunch of big ministry stuff. Yes. That that could actually be such a sweet savor because you got to remember the sweet savor, and he, he calls us a sweet savor, and you know that comes from, from the sweet savor offerings and it comes from the incense. Both of them burned up before you could get the savor. Both of them put on an altar. You know, and 
in that case, maybe there would be more of an altar, more fire. I mean, Jesus said in Hebrews 13, 13, I think it was, you know, it says there of him, let us go unto him outside the camp bearing his reproach. Do you know that the sin offering was offered outside the camp, was burnt outside the camp? And the reproach is that maybe you're bearing, you're not, they're putting sin on you that was not yours. Wasn't that the sin offering? They're putting sin on you that really wasn't yours, but you chose instead of being a, a goat that's going, this is bad, you know, I, I don't like this, no, you know. You're a sheep that opens not his mouth. It's Christ. It's Christ. And you don't do that because of abuse or um, ignorantly. Because if, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, then don't do it because it's pretty much useless. Might as well hit them on both cheeks. You know, they hit you, hit them back. I mean, am I right or wrong? I mean... <clears throat> you know, I don't think that brings any glory to God. I think that's the normal thing that anybody would do. But go with him outside the camp. That's what it calls for. It's, that scripture is calling for us, asking us to join him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, which is the reproach of bearing other people's sins. Yes. Crucifiers. Mm -hmm. You know, apart from Jesus in us, everyone's a crucifier except him. And I was thinking about, I don't know why I went to Job, but Job's big thing was he was going to maintain his way before the Lord. Yeah. And he maintained his innocence before his three friends, and that's what God got him on. And right. he really, and I, it just occurred to me that the first time in, in vindicating himself, he was accusing the Lord and throwing his report <clears throat> to the Lord, and he was crucifying the Lord. Right. I've never seen it like that before. Right. But really, whenever we, you know, insist on our own innocence and I'm righteous and I'm just, someone's got to die for that. You know, it's Jesus first and foremost. Maybe it's Jesus and our brothers. But anyway, I don't know right. if that really it just occurred to me. So. Well, the Lord's been dealing with me on the, this area of justification. And uh, I always put justification in one realm, and that was uh, justifying yourself to be right. But I saw it in another light. In fact, I didn't see it at all. The Holy Spirit sort of spoke it to me. And he said, well, justification is not just that, but it's also justifying yourself not to be wrong. And that hit me more than the other one because one is, well, I'm right. And you, you, know, you sort of try to follow me here. One is justifying yourself to be right. So you go, well, I'm right, and they're just wrong and stuff. But the other one is not standing up in that spirit and trying to say, well, I'm right, but rather, look, I just want to show you this or tell you this so that you'll know that I'm not wrong, that I'm actually a good person, you know? I wouldn't want to lose our relationship. Folks, if your relationship is built on you always having to keep things patched up, you know, and justified, you know what I mean? then there might be a problem. You see what I'm saying? In other words, maybe you don't have the relationship that you think or <clears throat> maybe the relationship that you have isn't worth the trouble. That, and then there's also this possibility, maybe being with the Lord and that relationship is more important than being with that person and violating the, Christ, and violating the life of Christ while you're trying to um, maintain something that has to be petted and, you know, you have to pet their flesh and, you know, and say, look, really, really, I'm not that bad. You're not saying, I'm, look, I'm right. You're saying, really, really, I'm not that bad. And I just want to give you a good explanation. If you have to do that, if you have to do that, there's a good chance you're going to have to do that again down the road. Because you understand what I'm saying? They don't know you. Pardon? You have to maintain it. And let me tell you, maintenance on that kind of stuff, it is not worth it after a while. So what I figure is, you figure it out early on. You go, you know what? And you have to do this in the Lord. But you go, you know what? This, 
I'm not losing what I thought I was losing because I see it for what it was and I thought it was this much and it really was only this much, you know, it's much, much smaller. Does that make sense? And these are hard things and, you know, I, I do. I genuinely hate talking about this kind of stuff because it's explanations that usually people don't want to hear or whatever, um, but it's Christ. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't have to be Christ. We can actually do the very same thing in our own flesh, but you're going to end up hating people or you're going to end up resentful or resenting the Lord that you went through that for the Lord because you never got over it. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. See, I learned all this, you know, way up on the high mountain with God. No, way in the valley messing up, <laughs> you know. And, <clears throat> you know, I'll just use an example of a friend that I had years ago. And, I mean, we were, we were like brothers, and, and his wife and my wife were real close, and we were having kids at the same age, and they were growing up together and just loving one another and just such a, a wonderful relationship. And uh, at a certain juncture, the Lord, the Lord, and I know it to this day, the Lord told me to leave that particular fellowship that, that this family was part of. <clears throat> and, I, you know, I'm going to obey the Lord. You know, I am going to obey the Lord. And so uh, <clears throat> the message that we got shortly after we left was, uh, well, you, you've left God and you're, you know, you're not, <clears throat> you're not really a man of God and all this junk. <clears throat> Coming from a guy that, I mean, to me, we were this, this knitted together. And so one day Deb said, well, you know what, I'm just going to, because they lived right across the street from us. When I say across the street, I mean you walk across the street and they're right there. Uh, and their kids playing in the yard and our kids playing in the yard. Now what do we do? You know what I mean? <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, so Deb made a pie and took it over there and knocked on the door and the guy came to the door and she said, you know, just want to ask you guys to forgive us and da 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 da, -da. and he said, I don't want your pie and slammed the door. Okay. Well, she came back and told me that and, you know, I went into my bedroom in there and just laid down on the couch and I bawled like a baby, bawled like a baby. Cried. I mean, you, you know in the scriptures where it talks about my, my tears run down like rivers? I experienced that. It felt like a river, not like, you know, it was like, I, and I, because, <clears throat> you know, and we'd been together for years. We went through Bible school together and all sorts of stuff. And it took me years to get over that. Years. Years. And it was a deep, deep hurt in me. And, and one day the Lord, you know, you remember how, uh, you remember how Samuel kept praying for King Saul? King Saul had failed, and, and God said, I've rejected you. And so Samuel, a man of God, keeps crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, you know, please reinstate Saul. Well, <laughs> you know, David represents Christ, and Saul represents the flesh. And he, the Lord goes, look, finally one day, you know, he's... He's praying, you know, the same old stuff. It's like you get in your own little realm. Oh, Lord, you know, it's like the, we don't even realize the Lord's there. You know, we're just doing our, oh, Lord, you know. And the Lord shows up and said, look, I want you to stop praying for Saul. I'm not going to reinstate him. He's rejected. I want you to go to Bethlehem and to a certain man there and I want you to anoint one of his sons and he's going to be the very one. He's going to be a man after my own heart. <clears throat> well, once it came from God <laughs> it came, and clear, clarity came, he went, Oh, okay. And you never hear, you know what I mean? He never goes back and goes, are you sure? None of that stuff. You know, it's like, okay, look, the Lord made up his mind. Well, the Lord came to me and he said, he said, look, you're, you're mourning over a relationship that never was. It was in your mind, but it never was. 
you never had anything with this person. You never did. It just showed up one day that you didn't. And I just kind of went, what? <laughs> what? You know, my pretty, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, and uh, he said, no, you, you're mourning something that never existed. He said, if you saw it the way it really was, you'd have just got up and gone on and said, okay, well, I'm with the Lord. But it took me years, and it took a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. But when I heard from God, then I understood. All right, so, so this, these scriptures are going along the line of Jesus, and it's different. There, you have the, the, the slapper and the slappy, right? You have the crucified and the crucifiers. And he goes on down. Um, and if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Well, you know. Why are you taking me to the court? This is not right. This is all, you know, messed up, man, you know. And we get all that. We're just so worldly. We can't see by Christ. We don't have dove's eyes. We don't see, you know. I mean, that's what, that's what, that's what the man in Song of Solomon, the king, the Lord, said to his bride, you know. The, you are beautiful. You have dove's eyes, you know. We go, oh, she's beautiful because, you know, her eyelashes are so long and they're like fluttering doves and, oh, you know, and, and all that's fine, you know, but I'm trying to make a point here. <laughs> I'm in trouble, aren't I? <laughs> now I'm embarrassed. <clears throat> but we, you know, it's all this, you know, oh, and it, that's not what he's talking about. That's not where he's coming from. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, the Holy Spirit, the dove, the way that he sees, you see. And that's beautiful to me. And that touches his heart. You can read it in the Song of Solomon. It genuinely touches his heart. See, I read stuff like that. I don't just go, oh, that's a nice little story. Oh, thou art fair, you have dove's eyes, and just read on, you know, and just sort of, you know, and just read right over. I go, wait a minute, this is not a story. This is trying to convey the heart of the Lord, and that's him speaking, and he's talking about the bride, which is us, and what he's saying is beautiful about us is that the Holy Spirit has gotten enough control that we see by the Spirit's eyes into these things instead of, you know, well, you know, you know, oh, I am beautiful, aren't I? No, you're not. You have dove's eyes. Shut up. <laughs> you know? You, that's what I'm, I'm enjoying what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. And so, you know, that's just an example to me of so many, well, the whole Bible, but I mean so many scriptures that I feel the Holy Spirit, I feel the tug of him pulling me to say, you know, get past the ink on white paper. Do you feel? Do you sense my presence? And when I sense the presence of the Holy Spirit, you know, yeah, it, I, sometimes I sense him in the service and I lift my hands like this. But when I'm reading the word and I sense his presence, I sense him beckoning me to, to, to discover the real heart of the Lord instead of staying religious and just reading and saying, well, I know that book. Do you know the Lord in it? Well, not really. You know, oh, is the Lord in that book? <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know, really, you know? <clears throat> well, the Pharisees knew all the books. They had to memorize them, at least the Pentateuch. They had to memorize the whole Pentateuch. You know, in the beginning, was that's where you start. Okay, ready? Go. Quote the whole Pentateuch. Okay. <laughs> you Bible school students need to get it together. <laughs> But you see, but you, you see that the Pharisees could memorize the book and then look up and Jesus is right there and not see Jesus, not get it. All right, so if they can do that, I'm capable of doing that. And instead of looking down on them, I need to look within my own heart and say, say Father, you must 
father me into the truth of your being or I'm going to take another son that has Christ in them and I'm going to crucify them someday. And I don't want to do that because I love you and I don't want to be a crucifier. I want to somehow, because I'm not that way and I'm so contrary and I admit it, and it's like I have to push all of my soul and my flesh and my fears about me aside. And I have to say, but you are capable. And so I'm asking you, even if it's just a tiny voice compared to all these others, I'm asking you to only give heed to that tiny voice and bring me forth conform to the image of Christ. And trust, and, and that's where faith comes in, real faith. That's where you're operating in faith. Okay, man, this is not possible. I am a hopeless case, but, you know, I do have a little, you know, it's like a little spark in a very dark dungeon <laughs> of, of, Lord, a Father, please do something that I could never do. Fan these flames and, and bring forth your Son. And, and walk in that faith. And you know what? You'll, you'll never be perfect. So you almost can never leave that place. The sad thing is we have altar calls and people come down and they're at that place at that moment and then they go away and then they have to come back, you know, years later, or weeks later, or months or however long. And, and uh, I've seen myself do it over and over and over. So then, you know, I just get where I realize it's so small that I can't even stay on course. <clears throat> but you, you, I'm asking you to respond to that and not to everything else and make it where one day, you know, what is the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It gets brighter as the day goes. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter. Yes! See, those, see that brings me hope then. You know, it's not just a scripture. You're, well, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It gets bright. You know what I mean? And just sing it. woo And then walk out and, 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 and you, you, your life just gets darker. Yeah. You know? But you read it and you go, that, I, you know, a starving man will grab hold of this, the smallest thing that, you know, and look at that and go, this is hope for me then. You know? The, pro the reason why I think a lot of Christianity doesn't move that direction so much is because we're so busy trying to fix everybody else. We're so busy thinking, you know, well, and we see somebody do something, well, that's wrong. We're judging. We're judging, you know. Well, that ain't right. And what we mean is that's not the way I would have done it. Well, I mean, am I right or wrong? I mean, there's something to this. You know, and you go, you see this. And, you know, if, you, if there's 10 people in a room in one task, and, and, and if you could have 10 rooms with the same task in it and divide them all up, send them all into a room, there'd probably be 10 different ways of doing it. Yeah. You know. You know, it's not about a specific way. It's about what's Christ. And what's Christ may be, instead of taking the high ground, taking the low ground. What's Christ may be dying to your own concepts and your own wishes and your own uh, glorious understanding of, you know, in your head, well, you know, everything has to be done. You know, one of the things about me being pastor is I really don't tell us what to do a lot. I mean, hardly at all. Some people even get upset at that. <laughs> it's like, well, you're a cult leader, but you won't tell us what to do. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but... You know, I mean, the, the, the problem is, is we get wrapped up in our ways or we get wrapped up in there's only one way of doing this. I remember, uh, gosh, what was it? Lord, help me to remember the exact of it. There was something, there was something wrong with the car. And, um, 
there was something wrong with the engine of our car, and we were we were newlyweds, and you know, it's like we didn't have any money. <laughs> I was like, oh Lord. So I'm going, okay, Lord, you're gonna have to bring in money for this. You know, you got to do that. You know, send somebody who's gonna bring money. You know, and he he goes. What? <laughs> it really was kind of like that. It really was. You know, I'm just telling you my, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> dyslexic relationship or something. But I, but it's kind of like what? And I went, you know, bring money. We got a problem here. And he goes, I've got any number of ways I can fix that, and I can't remember them all. But he started naming off all the ways. You know, I could have, I could have your neighbor walk over and go, well, what's wrong with your car here? And I, well, I don't know. He goes, well, I'm a mechanic, you know, or he could have, you know what I mean? There was this, he just started laying out, and I went, oh my God. I mean, he just ran through about five of them, and I just went, you're so creative. <laughs> 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 you know, and, you know, it's not that he was so creative because he only listed a few. Just imagine if he had to just unloaded. But it's it, the, the, the truth to recognize wasn't that he was so creative, but I'm so narrow. You know, well, it's just one way. There's only one way this thing can be done. You know, you people need to line up, you know. There you go. You're good. And uh, y'all need to line up in the, in the clear side of the way I see things. And I'll tell you what, the Lord will deal with you enough that you'll go, you know what, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, and that used to drive some of our people crazy here in this fellowship because I just go, well, what do we do? I don't know, you know. I don't know. Somebody, somebody actually asked me something within the last month. You know, well, what, well, you know, they came to me and it was like, Pastor, we've got this and this and this. And, and trust me, people don't just come to me in this fellowship. They come to me in email and text and any number of ways. And I've got this problem and what should I do? So if you can imagine a, a email or text, you know, and, and it's this scenario, but that could lead to this or over here. And, and what, what should I do? How should I handle this? And I just wrote back, I don't know. They're going. They're going. But you're a pastor. You know everything. Really? Oh, yeah. Trust me. I've I've been around a lot of pastors all my life. We all are pretty dense. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know. I mean, it's rare to find a pastor that can't get past this. You know what I mean? Much less everything else. I mean, there's so, the Lord is so wide in so many things, not just how to ha handle things, but in so many areas. And it's just very difficult because, well, I'm the pastor and I, you know, okay, well, when you were raising your kids, uh, did you tell them to go, you know, brush your teeth? Why? Because I'm your, I'm the daddy. Okay, well, I can understand that to some degree. But really, is that the only reason why we do what God wants us to do? You know, or our past, you know, well, you, he's the pastor. For God's sake, he said it. Let's just do it. Is there another scripture that could guide us into the spirit of Christ? In relationship to that, I'm just saying. <clears throat> well, what if somebody's not a pastor, but they hear from the Lord? Could... <laughs> Could that happen? See, John hit the nail on the head for most churches. And could that happen? Could someone else hear from the Lord? And the answer is, if we're the body of Christ, the, the mind of Christ is in his body. It's not in one member. And so once you realize that, you're going, look, I need to be open to everybody and every possible uh, thing that God might want to do. I mean... I hate to keep getting off on these stories, but the, but um, once with the church that I was part of, there was a guy, and he got sideways with the pastor, and I was the assistant pastor, and he he would stand up in church, and he would go, you know, you know, this man talking to the 
about the preacher that was standing up there talking, this man is a heretic, and da-da-da-da, and he would quote a lot of scriptures and stuff like that, and, you know, the pastor would sit him down and whatever, and, and that kept going on until it got bad that he's walking in the back of the church yelling while the service is trying to go on and stuff like that. <clears throat> and uh, and so the the... So the, so the guy who was the pastor asked me and this other brother, well, I want you to escort him out and not let him into our services. I'm going, now, now I'm a bouncer. I have been reduced to a freaking bouncer. I love Jesus. I shouldn't have to be doing this kind of stuff. I did weird, you know, in Oak Cliff, I've done some bouncing, okay. <clears throat> So we escort the guy out, and then we lock the door on him. Okay, so this. <laughs> yeah. Now you know I have to tell you I was I was in my what was I I was in my mid twenties then. Yeah, and I'm just like, well, you know, I mean, I'm just a kid, you know. I mean, I'm just going what. Is this right? Is this wrong? I don't know, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, we got him locked out. So he stands out there, and he's yelling so loud you can still hear him during the service. Okay. <clears throat> so, the, so the pastor tells us, uh, next service, if he comes around, make sure he doesn't get in, and then keep him away from the door. <laughs> and I'm just like... You know, so and this guy's like weighs twice what I do. I mean, he's a big old boy, all right? So, you know, we're, we're leaning into this guy and, you know, pushing, and he's holding up a Bible, waving it, going, yeah, the Lord, you know, you know, thus say the Lord, I'm going to write Michelob over this place. <laughs> Sorry, I Ichabod. <clears throat> Am I good or what? <clears throat> so finally, after several Sundays of that, he comes. We're trying to push him off. And finally, I said to him, interestingly enough, his name was John. <clears throat> but it wasn't this John. No relation. Because no <laughs> he's not twice my size. <laughs> you lost a lot of weight, have you? <laughs> and uh, so... I said, I said, John, would you just sit down here on the steps with me just for a minute? I, wanted, I just want to talk. I said, uh, um, and, I, and I told him, I said, look, I'm not pro the pastor or anything. I want to tell you something. And so he sat down, and I said, look, I'm not ignorant of the faults of the pastor. I'm not ignorant at all. In fact, I am well aware, and at that time I was the assistant pastor. <laughs> I am well aware. And so I named off some things just to make sure that he, he knew, because it could look like I'm, you know, got my head stuck in the sand or something. And I let him know, and I said, but I want you to know why I don't just do what you're doing. And I started explaining some of these things of the nature of Christ that I was seeing at that time, and hopefully have grown a little more since then. But you know that we, we preach the cross, right? And he goes, yeah, well, what does that mean to us individually? So, well, we believe that life comes out of death. And that instead of, you know, attacking and, you know, saying all these stuff and calling it prophecy and quoting all these weird scriptures that we believe that God can move in someone's life when we, by Christ, lay down our life, whatever that means and however that means, I said to him. Anyway, my explanation was a little clearer and stuff because it fit the exact situation at the exact moment. When I got through, he went, huh. <laughs> because he'd been a member for a long, long time. A long time. In fact, this guy was a member of Berean way back. Okay, with me and 
the pastor. And after I, exp I explained this, <clears throat> he said, so, so that's, you know, so you do see what I'm saying. I said, yeah, I see what you're saying, but, I, but I'm not going by that. I have to live by the word of God and the life of Christ. And he said, uh, he said, man, I see what you're saying. <laughs> he never came back again. He never came back again. Well, Jesus is saying, you know, turn the other cheek. He's saying, if they try to take something away from you, then give it to them. You know, instead of doing all this fighting and, well, we're right and you're wrong. Well, no, we're right and you're wrong. You know, Jesus said, you're all wrong, but I'll die. Didn't he? You know, you know, you're not going to die. And if you do die, it's, you know, it's going to be a violent death. It's not going to have any virtue to it. It's just another, another one bites the dust. <laughs> anyway. So, um, anyway, how much time we got? A few minutes? Uh, uh, you got like 13 minutes? 13 minutes. Well, I'm not going to use it all, but I am going to just finish with reading a couple of sentences. Three, I think, left. Uh, he was crucified, and they were the crucifiers. In the actual nature of the thing, Rome deserved to die. And Jesus deserved to live. But at that point, Jesus died and Rome lived. Okay, come on. Can, can, put yourself in that situation. Can we believe that we can affect the whole nation of Rome, the, whole, the power of Rome? I mean, they were the most powerful nation on the planet at that time, and they had developed war like nobody else had developed up to that point, okay? So how are we going to conquer these guys? How are, we, is, are they going to be defeated? Well, again, uh, you've got to become stronger. You've got to, you know, you've got to do, no, no, no. <clears throat> they deserve to die, and Jesus didn't. But Jesus died, and they didn't, okay? But, but at that point, Jesus died, and Rome lived. However, we find that later, Rome ceased to exist, and Jesus still lives. Right? You know, Italy is there, but folks, the Roman Empire is gone, <laughs> and it's really gone. <laughs> so, but can we believe at that moment of the height of their power in their, and, and where are they displaying their power more than hanging Jesus up on a cross, mocking him, shoving a spear in his side, and, you know, putting a crown of thorns on his head and say, oh, you're a king, <laughs> you know, and all this kind of stuff. And people are honoring you as if you're a king. Well, here's, you know, here's their king. Here hangs the king of the Jews. Jesus didn't go, well, this just ain't right. He didn't. He went, this is the beginning of the end for you guys. <laughs> And it was, and it was. Not with malice, because he died to save every one of them. Not save their kingdom. He, it is a fact he came to destroy their kingdom. But not by destroying, but by being destroyed. Now, that's hard for us to understand. I know that. I, you know, again, my words are never enough, and I can never fully explain a nature that was eternal and long before me and be long after me. I can only explain that what little I've seen and what I believe with all my heart that the kingdom of God, that little stone is taken out. Remember in the book of Daniel? And thrown at a mountain. But that was the cross, see, and that's what we don't see. We say, well, even a little guy can beat up a big boy. You know, we don't see the cross. But the fulfillment of that is this kind of kingdom overcame that kind of kingdom. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time and for the things that you've been uh, 
trying to communicate with us. And we recognize that it's just a man talking unless the Holy Spirit breathed life into it and, and breathe beyond. Not just breathe life into what I'm saying, but breathe the heart and soul of what you're about, what your kingdom is consists of. So we ask you to, to forgive me as a mouthpiece and such a frail vessel and lacking in so many ways of being able to communicate. And I ask you, Father, in forgiving me that you'll, you'll bless these people, that you'll touch their hearts, that you'll speak your word to them. And it'll not be heard as my word or what I know that they will get it directly from you. No middle man. Lord, thank you for dying. Thank you for being so selfless. And help your kingdom to come in us as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.